Welcome to Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow. I'm Len Mort. And I'm Dory Cronin. And this is our program for Lost Odds. This is the second program in a series of three. And uh, we're, we're having a, a good time doing this. We're trying to bring back uh, crafts and arts that uh, are disappearing. And uh, uh, some people don't uh, even know that they exist today. Uh, but before that, uh, I understand uh, we have a request, Dory. Your brother oh. had a request? Yes. This is for me. If and when I get paid 20 bucks for doing this on TV. Just saying. Very good. Thank you. And now you can prove it to <laughs> you know? uh, We've been doing field trips, and uh, this particular field trip, what do you think, Dory? Well, this section I thought was interesting because I didn't realize it was something that people could actually call up have somebody order. Let's say I was going to get married someday, make some special wedding invitations, and just adding that special touch. So that's why I thought this was pretty interesting to, to go see. Well, the, the, the thing that really gets me is today everyone has a computer, everyone has a digital or laser printer, and uh, they've become a printer. And uh, there's more to it than what meets the eye. You can sit at a computer keyboard and punch out uh, a series of letters, and you can print on perforated cardstock business cards, and, and uh, there's, there's just something missing there. There's, there's no life in those cards. Right. The same with a letterhead or an envelope. Uh, people think they're a printer now. With uh, Previously, it was a word processor, then it became the, the, the full computer, Apple PC or whatever, and uh, a little software or a thousand window fonts, but there's more to it. Step back in time. We have with us again, Jesse, and uh, you are in the printing business as well. You brought <laughs> yeah, back an old sorts. trade. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I uh, letterpress is sort of one half of my uh, my operation. Um, it was the uh, sort of my point of entry um, into uh, small business. I studied with a, a printer in Boston, John Christensen, uh, at the Firefly Press. And uh, one of the great things about my experience there is that, uh, in addition to learning how to set type and run the press, um, you know, this is sort of the basic uh, functions of, of letterpress printing, I also was able to learn how to cast type. Uh, so you know, the machines that were invented around about the turn of the 20th century uh, to solve the problem, how do you set type faster? Because everything else had sort of modernized. Um, up until the point in the mid 19th century, where you, know, you had fleets of compositors on the on the floor just setting books by hand, and they realized it just was not sustainable. So, um, two different people uh, basically arrived at a similar solution, um, and that's you start with molten lead brass matrices, you cast type, and then when you're done, you can melt it down and start over again. So that process was uh, w was a, was a wonderful opportunity because you know you can't really print unless you have type. And, a lot of people now print from polymer plates, and, and they call it letterpress, but it's not technically accurate because they're, they're using computers and, and uh, making plastic plates uh, from digital files. And you know, good design is good design. It doesn't necessarily, it's not inherently bad. It's just that uh, it tends to, um, I think, elide the, uh, some of the, the, the historical authenticity that people like to trade on but don't actually want to put in the effort to learn about. Um, so I actually, I kind of did it the hard way. I went and learned how to use the machines, learned how to cast type, and uh, I feel very proud of that uh, education. So. Well, one of the things that you mentioned when we were in your shop, and we'll go there in just a minute, was how the letters touch the paper. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I think if you're making something special, I think that's, I think a very nice touch that I think people will find very appealing. Yeah, I think it, uh, I mean, because it takes, it's so time consuming when you're setting type by hand, letter by letter, um, you know, you really do get to, uh, the design kind of takes on, uh, there, there are other uh, considerations. It's not just like, okay, do this as quickly as possible and then get it out the door. It's, you know, it's a, it's a cumulative process. It's a collaborative process. People can sort of bring their ideas to the shop and, and I'm delighted to work with people who have a, a vision for what they want. It's not just, you know, here, take this and do it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the process does, does, it is involved and it is slow, but I think in the end, if you are aware of the uh, opportunities that, that it affords you, you can, you can 
sort of it results in some 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 worthwhile typography and you know it's the thing that really interests me is my dad was in the same printing business right. when I was growing up. Yeah. Uh, he worked with a letter press. Uh, he set type by hand. Mm -hmm. I tried that, or I did that when I was in uh, junior high school, and uh, I took on a different side of that, mm -hmm. you know, as a trade. Right. Hand lettering, not hand setting. Mm -hmm. And uh, with that, let's take the people on a field trip that uh, we were on to your studio and, Great. and see what goes on in a, a letter press print shop. Okay. Right, let's go. Well, Dari, here we are here at the studio of Jesse Marcelet. Yep, tucked and, into West Millbury. And uh, he's going to explain to us while we're here of, uh, just what this printing is all about in uh, a program of, of lost arts. This is an art that has faded into the background and almost uh, uh, extinct. And uh, Jesse is trying to bring it back. Yeah, we'll and, take uh, a look. Let's take a look. Jesse is going <laughs> to explain to us just what's going on. Well, welcome to Marcellet Press and Letter Carving and uh, Resurrection Ironworks. Um, it's funny how we've become so used to the new technologies, but they've only been around for a couple of generations, 50 years maybe. Letterpress printing, as I do it, has been around for almost 500 years, and you know, it's not that ancient in terms of you know when it was a viable economic or a industrial process, but. Um, Around about 1950 or so, uh, photo typesetting and then digital typesetting sort of replaced letterpress. And I think a lot of people were just glad to be rid of it because it's heavy, it can be loud, can be very dangerous. Uh, and it's dirty, noisy, and expensive. And I think when the new technologies came along, uh, it was kind of a sigh of relief because people went from being blue collar to white collar. You know, the, the typesetters sat at computers and, uh, and you know, the, the old sort of compositors, the linotype operators. Uh, they were either trained up or shipped out. So um, the fortunate thing is that letterpress was so materially intensive that there was a lot of it to go around. And even in the last great purge in the 1970s, when things were just being given away, um, there was still enough of it there that a lot of good stuff has remained. And it's allowed people like me to come along and, uh, and learn the craft the way it was originally intended to be done, uh, which I think is really important because you know we're all so used to computers. but. Uh, a lot of what makes digital typography uh, and, and modern printing the way it is, is, is it's precisely its letterpress lineage. Um, a lot hasn't changed that much with our alphabet in 1,500 years or so, 500 years maybe. Um, we've added a few letters in the last 500 years. But uh, yeah, for the most part, the technology uh, is, is pretty conservative by nature. So uh, anyway, I've been very fortunate to have come along. Uh, I studied creative writing in college. Uh, a small school in Boulder, Colorado called Naropa uh, University. And it was uh, heavily emphasized the sort of do-it-yourself aspect of, of uh, traditional crafts. And as a creative writing student, I was able to use the letterpress uh, print shop and uh, had a blast just setting type. I and mean, I didn't really know what to expect. I figured I was just going to get my three credits and then move on, on to conventional publishing or whatever it was I was going to be doing after graduation. But uh, I, I, I discovered what became one of my great uh, life passions, and I'm very, uh, very pleased to be able to do it for people. Um, you know, anyone off the street, wedding invitations, uh, stuff like that. Um, you know, it's 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 an old technology, but it's still good at what it always did, and uh, and that's kind of how I'm set up. I'm not really doing precious fine printing for the sake of it. It's it's really a service that I'm trying to provide. It's a graphic design letterpress uh, printing outfit. So anyway. That's a very rambling, sort of convoluted introduction to a fairly straightforward, simple process. Uh, letterpress is the irreducible uh, combination of type, ink, paper, and pressure. I mean, it's really that simple. Um, right now, we're focused on the type aspect because we have to set some type. And the thing to remember about letterpress, uh, the way I'm doing it now, the traditional method, uh, is that it's all set by hand, one letter at a time. You're really sort of building language uh, as you go. and um, you know, you can only be so quick at it. Eventually, you know, they'd invented machines that bypassed the hand comp and went straight to the mechanical device, and then you could typeset much faster, and that's basically what made the, the daily newspaper possible, the linotype machine. Uh, and then book work became more about the monotype machine because you could get uh, arguably finer typographic refinements. Um, 
But what I'm going to do is uh, just a simple uh, handset job. Uh, it's a quote that I like because I think it, it actually relates to what Derek does as well. Uh, and that's the eye knows when the hand is done. It was a quote from a printer up in Vermont, Greg Jolly. And uh, ever since I saw it, it kind of uh, you know, galvanized the, some of the philosophical underpinnings of, of why I'm called to the work that I do. Um, because it's so much about the visual, about training your eye, learning how to see. Uh, it's, amazed, it's amazing to me, having gone through this process, uh, how long it takes for you to stare at something before you really know what you're looking at. Uh, and it just really takes that time. There's really no substitute for it. You just have to keep looking and looking. And uh, both printing and letter carving benefit from, from a visual intelligence that, that really just has to be made, has to be earned. Uh, and I'm still in the process of earning it. I'm not there yet, but I'm, I'm getting there. So uh, I've pulled out a case of type. It's a uh, Sistina. It was a typeface designed by a German uh, calligrapher and type designer, Hermann Zopf. And I'm, I'm very fortunate to have a few sizes of it. Um, you know, it's one thing to have a single size of a single face, but if you can combine uh, families, you can actually do a lot more work um, to, uh, to please yourself and hopefully others. So I'm going to just start setting, and we'll see what happens. This here? Yes. This is a comp stick. This is the, has an adjustable uh, sort of upright. That's called the knee. And uh, it's, it's actually set on various increments of uh, what are called picas. Points and picas are the standard unit of measurement for letterpress. Um, a, a point is 1 12th. Let me see. I always get this mixed up. It's, a pica is 1 6th of an inch, and a point is 1 12th of a pica. So you can figure that out if you like. <laughs> um, but the, uh, the comp stick is basically the, the tool that you use to set the type. And you, you set one line, and you, you fill it out with, with word spacing, non-printing low spaces. Um, and then when you're done with that, you set another line directly on top of it. Because if you think about type, if you're printing from it, you have to remember that it's backwards. It's the, the reflective uh, image of the letter as it's meant to be read because it's making an impression. Mm. Um, so as a typesetter, you get very adept at reading upside down and backwards. Um, you don't set backwards. You actually set left to right. But because it's upside down, that allows you to set subsequent lines and have it read the way it's intended to be read. So. People watch me typeset or, or print or, or carve letters, and some of them uh, betray themselves by saying, wow, that must be so tedious. And I say, well, for you, it would be torture. <laughs> if you think it's tedious, it's going to be awful. But uh, it's actually uh, quite meditative and, and contemplative, and you just kind of get into the rhythm uh, once you kind of know where everything is. Uh, the lay of the case uh, actually is just something you have to memorize. It seems daunting at first, but it does make a kind of sense. You have the lower case on the left side and the upper case on the right. It used to be you'd have separate cases. You'd have lower case, upper case. Um, but they've been combined uh, for, for maximum efficiency. And the caps are more or less alphabetical, except for uh, J and U are, are at the end of the case, because when this was designed, J and U weren't separate letters. It was I and V. Um, but the lowercase has its own arrangement, and you know it makes sense once you once you get used to it. Now, how old are the the letter sets that you're using now? Uh, these were uh, these are called foundry. This is a foundry face. This was actually made by a company that was in business strictly to provide the printing industry with new types, uh, and so uh, this was probably designed, I want to say, in the 40s, 50s. Um, the actual letter forms are, uh, they have uh, Roman origins. They're sort of hearkening back to uh, classical, uh, the, the classical age. Um, you know, each typeface essentially speaks in its own tone of voice. And every generation has its own typefaces that feels like they feel like it reflects the modern sensibility. But a lot of types were sort of backward looking and revivals. Um, you know, you have 
Renaissance uh, handwriting that would then sort of become you know, typefaces. And, and then the 20th century, once these machines that were invented to set type faster became more mature, then people started designing of, of the traditional typefaces. So, uh, so this is not as old as it might seem. something from over here. So in addition to, normally I would be, I'd be setting off in the same case, but this case is a combined uh, collection of three different sizes of, of this particular typeface. Um, and then the, the spacing material is actually, I'm, I'm borrowing from, from another case. Um, don't tell. <laughs> So what I'm going to do now, because I'm, I'm trying to emphasize the, uh, the importance of, of the aesthetic uh, in, in this line of work, um, if you were to set caps, these are all, this is a, a capital face. It's all, there are no lowercase uh, characters to it. If you're going to set it solid, uh, you're going to come, and, and I'm sure Lynn can appreciate this as a, as a letterer, you know, you, different letters have different sort of weight values, and if you pair certain combinations together. Sometimes you get a really tight fitting, other times it's, it's, it's open. As, I don't know if you can see this, but the, say the OW combination, there's a natural space in there because the di that diagonal stroke of the W kind of kicks away from the O. Uh, but if you have the HE combination, you have these two sort of ramrod stems. And when they're pressed close together, it, it looks kind of crunched. So what you want to do is uh, what we call uh, optically letter space them. And you take non-printing, thin spaces, um, you know, just made of the same type metal that, that you use for type, and you insert them between the sorts, and that sort of pushes things off and creates a, a more a sort of a visual harmony, whereas otherwise you wouldn't have that. And you can actually, not many people uh, who are in charge of these sort of graphic design decisions uh, can fully appreciate the importance of, of proper spacing. I mean, if you go anywhere, if you look at a billboard, if you look any kind of advertisement, you can really tell who has done their homework, who's been trained properly, and who is just collecting a paycheck because spacing, it's subtle, it's simple, but it, uh, it can give you away in a, in a hurry. So I find that it's always worth taking the time to do it properly because there's always the chance that, you know, that one printer who actually knows what they're looking at is going to see my work and, you know, they're the person that I'm trying to impress, them and myself. And I figure <laughs> if, if they're impressed, then everyone else should be happy. So, as long as Derek is impressed. <laughs> that matters too. So as you can see, it's a slow and fiddly process, but I'm not used to talking and typesetting, it can be a dangerous combination. <laughs> so we have a line that is the appropriate length, filled out the stick. And what you do to tell, if you want to make sure that the line is snug, you kind of lift it off its feet. The, the, the names for the, I mean, every part of the type has a name and it's all pretty much anatomical. You have the face of the type, the beard or the neck, which is where the type kind of slopes away from the surface, the printing surface, and then connects with the body of the type. And at the bottom of the type, you have the foot. So it's all kind of, you know, the people who are designing it were thinking uh, anatomically. It just makes, makes more sense. But what you do is you, you take either end of the line and you lift it, and if it all kind of comes together, then you know that the line is long enough. It's spread out enough. Otherwise, you know, you would pull up the quads and they would come up, but the type would just lay there in the stick. So, and the, when we get to the actual setup, you can appreciate 
the importance of appropriate line lengths. All right, this won't hopefully take too much longer. I want to say uh, that I was I consider myself very fortunate to have uh, returned back to Boston after I graduated from college because Boston and New England at large uh, is, is understandably proud of its graphic arts and printing legacy because it was a major uh, major industry for, for Boston, particularly uh, up until about the 50s and 60s. Um, so there are a lot of printers and book designers and typographers in the area and it, it has become an extremely nurturing environment for me to kind of come up through and my uh, main experience was was at uh, Firefly Press in Boston working for a man named John Christensen and it's not enough for him to have gone out and sort of rescued the presses and the type he actually went and bought the monotypes and the linotypes the machines that were invented to, to speed up the, the, the composition process and he mastered them, which, I mean, if you think about back in the day, everyone had a different job. I mean, you were either a handset compositor, you were a pressman, you, you know, collated sheets, you did folding, you were in the binder, you had, everyone had their own station. Um, but in order to make this remotely economically viable, I'm not saying that, that it is, but if you're going to make a, a, an honest attempt at it, you really have to master every aspect of, of the craft. And I think that, for me, realizing that it was, I guess, theoretically a dead industry, no one's you, don't, you can't really go to school for letterpress anymore. Um, I realized that there was a lot of pressure sort of taken off the process and I could, if I was willing and, and you know, pliant enough, I could actually learn a little bit about every aspect of, of letterpress uh, in addition to the, the historical scholarship. Uh, and it just seemed to me a bottomless uh, tradition. I could, I could explore every avenue. I could never be done with it. I'm, and actually letter carving for me was a, a natural extension of my interest in typography. I just kept going farther and farther back. Um, but uh, I, I just wanted to say at, at some point that I, I owe a, a great deal of uh, debt and gratitude to my, my teacher, John Christensen, because he, his severe training <laughs> made it all possible. Yeah. No replacement for severe training. Well, I suppose there is a replacement. It's Lackluster training. <laughs> it's hardly a suitable replacement. Right. All right, one more line, and then we're done. This part, anyway. Anybody want to race? <laughs> <laughs> One of those historical speed competitions that I'm afraid that the uh, typographic equivalent of John Henry would lose. <laughs> Computers are much too fast. I notice you don't have any rugs here. I can just imagine you tripping on a rug as you turn around and pulling <laughs> all that on the floor. Well, fortunately, I have a good grip. Uh, probably wouldn't happen quite so dramatically, but uh, actually I would welcome a rug because after standing on the concrete for hours on end, your back begins to feel it. So there are rubber mats that you can get to uh, alleviate the strain, but yeah. Well, the real problem is <laughs> given our recent uh, losing battle with meltwater, the, the rug would become uh, more of a pain than it's worth because it would be soaked under an inch of water. <laughs> There's a leak somewhere. 
We haven't really determined where yet, but. Now today, everyone seems to be a typesetter of sort of form. Didn't you know that when you buy a computer, you become a typesetter automatically? Yeah. It doesn't take any training or all, anything. I mean, you can just turn it on. Have a multitude of points at yeah. your fingertips. Yeah, and you don't even know what their names are. You don't have to know how to use them. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It's like some fancy cars come with their own parking space, if you think about it. But I'll bet you can't find Helvetica or Ariel in those trays. Uh, well, you could find Helvetica if I had it. I don't have it. But Helvetica was a, a metal typeface. Um, that was its origin. Ariel is obviously a digital um, uh, revival, if you like, or copy, if you don't like, um, uh, of, of pirating, if you, <laughs> if you really don't like. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's, that's all part of the tradition. You know, you, I don't despise or, or dislike or, or cast aspersions on modern typographers if they know what they're doing, if they appreciate their, the tradition, if they have learned something of the craft. Um, I'm not recommended that, re recommending that everyone go out and buy a letterpress because uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it can be, uh, you know, it can be a tricky situation. It's obviously very material in, uh, intensive and uh, it's all the things that people were glad to be rid of when, when the new technology came along. So, um, but yeah, there, as long as there are people who actually maintain some aspect of, of the tradition, I think that their work will improve as a result. Um, but uh, for me, I just, I need to be like handling the materials. I can't, like the screen for me is, is a problem being separated by a sheet of, uh, a pane of glass from the actual things that, that we're arranging, that we're designing. For me, the way that my mind works, uh, I feel much more comfortable uh, using these, these physical objects because there are things that you can't do and you probably shouldn't do um, with physical objects that uh, the computer just says, hey, do whatever you want. You know, it's, it's like, it doesn't matter. Uh, the spatial relationships are, are a lot different. Um, but I just feel much more comfortable kind of in the analog uh, process. Because I feel like it gives me more control. And my computer friends say, that's ridiculous. Because once you learn how to use the computer, you have all the control that you had before. But, but what you can't give me along with the control is the enjoyment of using the, pro of using the tool. You know, the computer is a tool, just like anything else. But uh, for me, it's just not fun. And this is fun, you know, getting dirty, making things. Um, you know, my, my print runs run from a copy of one to 2,000. You know, it's not like I'm doing big business here. But it's, it's human scale, I like to say. It's sort of geared to the personal. You know, you have something that you want printed in type. I set the type for you. A few days later, you have your product. You can send out your wedding invitations. You can send out your business cards. You know, but it's a thing that has passed through human hands. And so much of the graphic design landscape looks like it doesn't even know what human hands look like. So. I'm trying to do my very small part to restore that balance. So we're done. We have our form of type, uh, and we're going to take it over to the imposing stone and lock it up in the chase. So now that we're, we have the form out of the comp stick, I'm putting in uh, what's called leading. And some of the terms from letterpress have survived into the digital realm, leading being one of them, point size being another. Um, so these are just the same, same material as, as type. It's just type metal. Uh, type metal is a, an alloy. It's a combination of lead, tin, and antimony. And uh, most people credit Gutenberg with the invention of printing, and that's not entirely accurate. He uh, perfected it. He's, we sort of have been chasing him for um, almost 500 years now because in the process of, of perfecting it, uh, you know, he, he basically set an <laughs> a, a very difficult standard to, uh, to achieve. But what he really did uh, was invent the, the movable type mold, which made um, uh, making types uh, greater quantities of type uh, more available because um, you could cast them one at a time and you could adjust the width of the uh, of the mold so that you can get a narrow character or a wide character depending on what letter you're using. Um, so anyway, lead and antimony was, was the sort of the, the uh, you think of the old 
alchemists trying to spin lead into gold. Well, they didn't get gold, but they got type metal, and that's almost as good, uh, if not more so, because of what it's been able to do for us. Um, so now I'm just kind of spacing the lines out a little bit. I'm, I'm kind of going just by instinct and eye. Um, and once I actually pull a proof, that will tell us if there are any adjustments that need to be made. take our furniture, uh, kind of an odd term for the metal pieces uh, that actually hold the form in place. Not a very comfortable couch, but that's the term. And I don't know why, but there it is. Furniture. Basically just fill out the chase. This metal uh, frame is called a chase. And it's what gets fitted into the press with the form locked in place uh, for printing. This is the stage where it's absolutely critical that each line is the same length. Because if it isn't, then when you go to lock it up with the coins, these are called coins, they just expand when uh, they're activated by a key. And they don't have a very wide sort of capacity, but enough to do the job of holding everything in place. So when we have everything filled out, take the planer, just a block of wood with a flat surface, rest it on the type, give it a few taps to make sure that all the type is resting on its feet. And then you expand the coins gradually, one by one on either side, to make sure that the pressure is evenly distributed. This was a... Uh, <laughs> became an unlikely magic trick when I had a, a friend and his young family come by the shop a couple weeks ago, and uh, two young girls, about uh, four and six, and I showed them the type form. I did the whole demonstration. I was moving things around, and I locked everything up, and then I lifted it off the, off the stone, and they were like, oh, that's amazing, because they, <laughs> they couldn't you know, imagine <laughs> the, the, you know, the, the trick involved, but it's just these little very powerful small uh, coins. So you have your... Uh, I'm actually just assuming that the line, the lines are all the same length, but what you would do, and fortunately they are because otherwise it'd be a mess, um, what you do is you lift up the chase and you just kind of apply pressure onto the face of the type, and if anything drops out then you know you're some measure uh, away from, from, from a full line. And you know, this, this, is, this is a critical <laughs> uh, stage in the process because if you put Sometimes you can be fooled. You can lock something up and it feels fine, and then you put it in the, in the press. And just the repetitive meeting of the platen in the press uh, can, can dislodge things. And if something drops out, uh, you could destroy your press and maybe take off your arm in the process. So, so there are things that you need to be aware of. As I was saying before, there are mistakes that every printer should make at least once. That's not one of them. <laughs> because there are some mistakes that you can afford to make not even once. And actually, there's no ink in the Getting ahead of myself a little bit here. Let's go big. So I've chosen a very masculine shade of pink for the demonstration because in this light it will probably show up better than the dark blue that I was going to use. So it's rubber. It's this is, yeah, rubber-based ink. Some of it is oil-based, um, and it's just 
pigment with some rubber or oil compound. Uh, and you just dab a little bit on the press. A little bit. And then put that over there. What do you use for cleanup with the rubber bits there? Uh, there are different solvents that you can use. I use mineral spirits, probably. I try to be as uh, <laughs> As, as conscientious as I can, but there are, there are just some things that even though they may be more harmful, they do a better job. So I just say mineral spirits, and then I try, try to be careful with it when it's done. I know um, years ago they used to use benzene. Exactly, yeah. Which is been banned pretty much now because of its uh, cancer-causing qualities. Yeah, and there was an old uh, printer's prank. I actually was fortunate enough not to have experienced it firsthand. But a, a young apprentice would be asked to inspect a galley of type. And the, the old guy printer would say, yeah, there's something wrong with this galley. There's, there's type lice everywhere. And so the young apprentice, not knowing any better, would say, type lice, that sounds awful. Where? where what, what can we do? And the printer will say, oh, well, you know, get, look real close. And maybe you can see it. And so of course, the, the, printer, or the apprentice would lean in close. And the old guy printer would, would pour benzene and, and splash it in the guy's face, thinking, it's just benzene, <laughs> right? But, you know, that was a traditional prank that uh, fortunately didn't last very long, because maybe that's why so many people were getting cancer, because they were taking it in the eye and uh, elsewhere, where it didn't belong. So this press is uh, circa 1920. It's mostly cast iron. And uh, yeah, it's, I can genuinely say they do not make them like they used to, because they don't. Those are great pieces to have to move around. Yeah, this thing weighs literally a ton. It's, I call it the a crouching buffalo of <laughs> cast iron. So you bring the chase in, lock it into the press. And we've got our fresh tympan on there, which is always, it's got like a, like a freshly made bed, just nice and smooth, ready for whatever. In this case, an impression. So I ink it manually just to uh, establish where it is on the platen, on the tympan rather. But when we're actually printing, it'll be motorized. Just adding more packing under the tympan because it actually didn't even make an impression. So let's try this again. So quiet. Oops. So putting little register pins uh, on the tympan here to hold the paper in place while it's being printed.
probably already confirmed a lot of your suspicions that, yes, in fact, this is very tedious and boring. <laughs> but I promise you it's worth it in the end. Indeed, and that's part of that is sort of it weeds out a lot of people because you know most people their attention span is much too short for that sort of thing. But there are no shortcuts. All right, so now we're going to pull Another proof magic trick that I showed the girls when they visited. this impressional strength and cast iron and just heft goes into making a very delicate meeting of the inked type and the paper. Uh, it's very subtle. Well, it's not centered. Uh, I can tell you that. It's not, it's a little under inked, but you get the idea. So the idea being that after years of doing, eventually the eye can see the work of the hand and people say, well, when do you, when are you finished? And it's like, well, when you look, when it looks right, it's right. And, uh, you know, you can overthink it, you can take measurements, you can, you know, do any number of things, but if it doesn't seem to you, if it doesn't have a certain kind of visual harmony, then, then it's worth kind of doing another proof, making another adjustment until you, until you get it right. So, that. You think you've got your type and you make your impression and you think, yes, I'm done. But you're only halfway there because you still have to distribute the type. <laughs> More work. So, anyway. How many pieces an hour would you be doing with the press run? Uh, I could comfortably hand feed um, maybe 500 sheets in an hour. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, the, the runs, they tend to be so low that, that speed isn't really much of a virtue. Um, I mean, and people think, well, if I want 100 business cards, that'll cost some amount of money, but if I want, you know, if, if if you only print 75, like, will that, will that reduce the cost? And it reduces the time spent printing by maybe three minutes, less than that. It's just. But not just set up. Yeah, the thing is with letterpress, the reason why it can, it can be uh, a costlier alternative is that all the work goes into the first copy. Um, you know, you, you spend the time setting the type, like this galley here for a wedding invitation, that was a day's worth of typesetting. Uh, pretty consistently just going from one thing to the other. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's all, you know, the, the actual time spent standing at the press running them off. I mean, there are adjustments that you can make and things you want to keep track of. You want to make sure that the inking is performing well and that you haven't damaged a character. Um, but for the most part, it's, it's an iceberg. You know, you're, the press time is basically the tip that you see and then everything else is the, the time spent setting the type and making other adjustments. And, so. so now you do your business cards one at a time. One at a time. And today you see ads on TV, 250 business cards, full color, mm -hmm. for $10. Yep. How can they do that? Well, their, their machines are just that fast. I mean, the, the, the methods of reproduction now are, are so state of the art and so fascinating and so beyond my comprehension. Um, I don't. I don't pretend to try to compete with speed, um, but I always 
kind of smile when I see the work that's being produced at such an amazing rate because a lot of it's not really well thought of or not thought out or, or just you know lacking in other areas that uh, you know the other some of us can sort of pick up the slack when if people choose to, to value it you know the, the aesthetic aspect the the, uh, the quality of the design um, you know that's what takes the time so you know if that's what you want then if that's what you're, you're wanting to get out of your business cards then that's an obvious route for you but with letterpress uh, it's emphasizing the presentation in addition to the information it's not just about access it's about display um, you know as I was saying earlier about it, it's something that you know it looks like it's been touched by a human hand you know there there's a process involved um, you know I think most people use a computer but few people actually know what's going on behind the screen uh, letterpress is entirely transparent and see-through you know it's it's all physical objects it's all things coming together fitting where they touch um, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm appealing to maybe a more antiquarian sensibility, you know, people who appreciate things being done well according to the old models. But there's no reason you can't get good, get good work out of the new machines. It's just that most people don't really have the patience or the training. Um, I think the big problem now is that we're, we're so far removed, even in the last 25, 30, 40 years, from this as a traditional practice that a lot of the teachers coming up through design schools aren't being taught about it. It's, just, it's like a a week, not even a week, it's, it's a day's information. You know, it's like something to, to blow past on your way to the, the cool new digital typefaces that you can play with. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a certain amount of uh, proselytization, proselytization in my work because it's, it's about educating as, as, as well as providing a service. You know, it's, it's, it's trying to share what I've learned and what I've appreciated uh, with others and, and fortunately there have been enough people who actually uh, take to it even though they don't maybe know what they're looking at necessarily it's something that uh, that you know captures their attention um, so that's kind of what I'm trying to to do for for my you know conscience and for the people who've trained me I'm trying to hopefully train others through the work and, and through just sharing it and, and the doing of it so it's a shame it's a dying art but it's, it's great that there's people like yourself that will jump in and try to save it, keep it, <laughs> keep it alive for yeah. people to see just uh, what they've lost. Well, I mean, I don't, I'm not prepared to say that my, my, my intentions are entirely altruistic and, and noble. It's, it's just fun. I mean, it's, for me, the way my mind works, it's, it's the perfect process because, uh, you know, it's, it's slow, it's time-consuming, and, you know, I'm slow-moving, slow-processing, so letterpress is ideal. Um, but the things that you can get with it when you have control, when you know what the, the process can accommodate, uh, can rival anything being produced by any other method. Um, I mean, the thing that, that I can do that other processes can't do is, is the impressional aspect. Um, you see the three-dimensional quality, the way the light rakes across a, a printed page. Uh, it's just there's a dazzle. There's a, there's a quality to it that you can't get otherwise. I mean, everything is so flat and, uh, and, and 2D when, you, when you're looking at digital offset or, or lithography and, and there's nothing wrong with that it's just that that there's an added dimension of I don't want to say quality but I, I will say depth literally and figuratively uh, because there there's a meeting of planes in letterpress that you don't necessarily get I mean lithography is you know you have inked rollers sort of touching paper and the paper sort of taking away by by offset um, but letterpress is you know finding that that micron of paper that will receive the pressure in the ink and then will take it with it when it's when it's pulled away. Um, so, you know, it tends to lay down a richer uh, inking, but it tends to be um, more saturated. Maybe I don't know. I think there's there's just there there are aesthetic qualities that even if you're not interested in it from a financial perspective, that there are advantages. Um, so, but I think when it comes down to it, if it weren't as much fun, I probably wouldn't be quite so. <laughs> high and mighty about it. <laughs> so, but. Well, now that we're back in the studio, what did you think of that trip? I was, I actually was very interested by it all. I was surprised how interesting I thought everything was. It was neat to see, it was neat to, to watch you ink up the wheel and, and mm -hmm. put everything onto the paper. I thought it was very interesting. The only thing you didn't have in there was the smell of benzene. 
Yeah, well, our chemicals are becoming more sophisticated these days. So, uh, matter of fact, I was I was reading just recently in a, one of my old my dad's old books, mm -hmm. and uh, it had all the containers, uh, fireproof containers for the benzene and everything, yeah. which was taken off the market because it was a carcinogen. Yeah, you know. Yeah. But back then, everyone washed the the uh, the rolls, the mm -hmm. the uh, ink plate, their hands with the benzene. Yeah, you, know, you wonder where they all went. Wow. <laughs> With that, we're, we're so happy to have been able to uh, tour your, your facility mm -hmm. and to have you in the studio. Yeah, well, I had a blast. I'm glad you guys could make it. And I'm sure that our viewers are going to enjoy what we did on a field trip. And with that, uh, mm -hmm. we end uh, with the uh, words of wisdom. And uh, the words of wisdom for today are, a smile increases your face value. Thank you. Thank you.